for fulfilling my special song request. <laughs> that has been one of my songs over the past few months that has been on replay for me. It's by some artists who are local to Chicago and it was just beautiful to hear you sing it and Elikum to hear you play it. So thank you for blessing us this morning. And thank you, Liz, for the blessing of being able to hear everyone in the sanctuary this morning. <laughs> it's really amazing to hear your voices. Um, all of us can hear it. We're not sort of surreptitiously having our earbuds in our ears. And it was really great to hear the scripture aloud read by you, Mary, this morning. Every time I hear it, I hear something new. And this morning, as you were reading and I was hearing, hearing it in the space, that phrase, it was a wilderness road, stuck out to me. We're all on this wilderness road and some of us might be on parts of the wilderness road where we see the beautiful water coming out of the rock or the trees and we feel very held. Some of us might be on another part of the wilderness road where it feels dangerous and treacherous. And my prayer is that this morning as we worship together, we all know that we're not on the road alone, that we can encounter one another on this wilderness road. Will you pray with me? Oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I've always had trouble falling asleep ever since I was a kid. I have a very overactive mind, one that often decides that Bedtime is the perfect time to build out a strategic plan or plan an entire budget or, I don't know, write a sermon. Part of this sermon was definitely written in the wee hours as I was trying to fall asleep. Even when I do my full bedtime wind down routine, turn off my phone, have a cup of tea, my mind just leaps into action the minute my head hits the pillow. So over time, I've developed a funny little habit. Every night as I try to go to sleep, I put myself in a story. I've been doing this for as long as I can remember. It started with Peter Pan, imagining myself on the island of Neverland somewhere, traipsing through the woods and learning how to fly. Over the years, I have traveled Middle Earth, lived among the Dashwood family in the British countryside and spent many, many, many nights at Hogwarts. Whenever my brain tries to pull me towards tomorrow's schedule or tries to make me completely redecorate the living room in my mind, I just direct it back to the story. I involve myself in a thrilling sword fight or I put myself in a faraway city and eventually I drift off to sleep. And this is more than just a, a bedtime trick, it's also a way for me to inhabit some of my favorite books. And I have a lot of favorite books. I have always been a bookworm to the point where it exasperated my parents, I think at times. I insisted on bringing piles of books on family vacations. I remember one time we arrived at the airport and we were weighing our bags and mine came in well over the weight limit. My parents couldn't figure out what I, a tiny eight-year-old, could have possibly packed to make my bag so heavy. And so they unzipped my bag and were not very happy to find like eight hardback novels nestled in among all of my clothes and shoes. I brought books 
everywhere, in the car, on the bus, even out to restaurants. My parents had to make a rule banning books and reading at the dinner table, which I didn't understand at the time. But now, as an adult, I can only imagine going out to a restaurant, you know, wanting to have good family time and family conversation, only to have your child prop her book up and promptly ignore you for the remainder of the meal. I'm happy to say that my social skills have improved over the years, but that my love of books is undiminished. Some people asked me what I did on my recent vacation, and I said I didn't really do anything but read. I read novels. I love that feeling of being swept up by a page turner, that book you just can't put down, falling into an undiscovered universe. And I really treasure the feeling when you connect with a character, when you feel like some part of you is reflected in the story. I see this same bookworm love in the eunuch of today's scripture. He too has fallen in love with a story. A story that led him on a pilgrimage from his home all the way to the temple in Israel. A story which he admits he still doesn't fully understand, but he is continuing to pursue. I really wish we knew the eunuch's name. I wish that so often when reading scripture, but as I was spending time with this story this week, I found myself longing for the name because he is such a rich and complex figure. He has so much to teach us, even though we only have this brief encounter. The eunuch is interesting to me and I hope to all of us because he's simultaneously an outsider and an insider. He is an outsider in gender and sex. As a eunuch, his bodily status was viewed by many as immoral, preventing him from fully participating in social and religious life. And while race as we know it had not yet been invented, yes, race was invented, he is what we would now call black. He has traveled from, to Israel from ancient Ethiopia, which could mean modern Sudan or really could refer to anywhere south of Egypt. So we can safely assume that he didn't look just like Philip and the other Middle Eastern disciples. So we see this figure and we can use our spiritual imaginations to think of a contemporary corollary. Perhaps someone who is an immigrant or a migrant, or perhaps someone who's part of the black trans community, one of the most oppressed groups in our society. Yet this is not all that defines him. So perhaps this is the first lesson he has for us this morning. The lesson that people are fluid, defined by so much more than we can see. Yes, he is an outsider in many ways, but he also has connections and power. He is close to the queen and he is, the scripture tells us, in charge of the royal treasury. So in other words, he is rich, smart, and educated. The eunuch is also a seeker. We see him exploring his faith. He's just traveled a great length to worship at the temple in Jerusalem. And now as he returns home, they're studying scripture, reading aloud from the book of Isaiah. And the passage they have chosen is a significant one. The eunuch is reading a poem entitled The Suffering Servant. Thank you to the writer of Acts, because we know exactly where this can be found. It's found in Isaiah 52 and 53. And the suffering servant is a poem all about being an outsider. It's about the pain and trauma and fear of being ostracized. 
And it's about God's promise of redemption. God's promise that the low will be lifted up and that love will be greater. That love will triumph. So this poem tells us something about what the eunuch is going through at this moment. He is connecting to these specific verses drawn to this acknowledgement of their situation and hope for renewal. Have you ever found yourself in a similar place? Drawn to a particular scripture, a particular story, because you see yourself in the pages. Oh, I hope you have, because it is a wonderful feeling, a holy feeling to know that God has a message for you. However, there are things that the eunuch doesn't fully understand about what he is reading. And I think we've all been there, at least I've been there. Sometimes the Bible is confusing. We read things and we're left sort of scratching our heads going, what in the world am I supposed to take from that? Which is where Philip steps in. Philip is one of the apostles who helped spread the good news after Jesus's resurrection. And I really love him in this text. He's such an enthusiastic disciple. I don't know if you heard it, but Philip is described throughout this passage by action words. He gets up and goes when the spirit calls. He runs to the chariot when he hears the eunuch reading. And when the two meet, there is this moment of such startling honesty. Philip asks the eunuch if he understands what he's reading. And the eunuch responds, how can I? Unless someone guides me. Oof, how often are we too scared to admit that? or to ask that question. My goodness, I think back to my first year in graduate school and it seemed like everyone in my classes had read all of the theologians whose names I couldn't even pronounce. And I was so scared to ask questions because I felt like an imposter because I didn't want to look stupid. Of course, the reality often is that you can't learn if you don't ask. So blessed be the eunuch and the ones who ask the questions. And blessed be Philip and the ones who answer them, the teachers and the guides and the mentors and the tutors. The eunuch desires to know and Philip desires to teach. And so the two ride along together with, with Philip interpreting the scripture and teaching all about Jesus. So here is the second lesson from our eunuch this morning. It is good to learn from one another. And it is important that we talk about scripture and talk about how we interpret it. I know that so many of us have been on the biting edge of the good book. We've been told that our bodies, our relationships, our desires, our beliefs are evil because of this verse or that verse. Even this very passage that I'm preaching on today has a really horrific history of anti-Semitic interpretation. And so it's vital, vitally important that we learn together how to read the word of God in life-giving ways, in ways that celebrate and honor all people. Now, some might ask, well, Reverend Sarah, how do you know that that's the way we should interpret this? And it's a good question. It's because that principle of interpreting in life-giving ways, it's reflected and found, I believe, in this text. As Philip and the eunuch continue their journey, they pass a body of water. And the eunuch exclaims, look, look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? What is to prevent me? I can imagine that question being asked in so many different ways. 
I don't know if it's rhetorical or if it's literal, if it's said with excitement or if it's asked hesitantly, hoping that this baptism might happen. Because the truth of the matter is that people have told this eunuch no before. Some could find reasons to prevent him. Some then and some now even. Some might prevent him from joining the body of Christ because he's a foreigner or prevent him from coming into their church because he's a person of color or because he's non-binary or because they don't have the right credentials or because they don't know everything yet or because no one can vouch for him or because, or because, or because, but Philip, Philip doesn't say a thing. And both of them go down into the waters and Philip baptizes the eunuch in the name of the creator and the redeemer and the Holy Spirit. And the eunuch goes forth rejoicing. This is such a beautiful story. The eunuch self saw himself within the story of God and pursued it straight into the divine waters. So the question I put forward for all of us is where do we see ourselves in the story? In the big story of God, but also in today's text, where do you see yourself reflected? Are you a seeker, a questioner, a student? Are you a teacher? Are you a bystander? Maybe the person who's driving the chariot and witnessing what's going on. Are you an outsider? And to be honest with yourself, are you at times someone who prevents others from entering. We all like to identify with the hero of the story, but it's just as important to recognize when we see ourselves reflected as the ones who are standing in the way to identify where we can grow. So here is our final lesson from the eunuch. We are part of this story and the good news bursts through any barriers that humans might erect. The people at the time of Jesus' resurrection could not have imagined the good news spreading as far as it did. The eunuch was from a part of the world that they were unfamiliar with, that they could only imagine. And God says, yes, the good news goes there too, to places you've never even seen. God's love extends so much further than we can imagine. And nothing prevents us from that love. Nothing, nothing about you. Nothing you feel is wrong with you. Nothing you've been told is wrong with you. Nothing you have done or haven't done, nothing. God's love cannot be stopped, not for you and not by you. So sometimes we have to get out of the way. We have to get out of the way of our own selves, out of our own self-doubt. Sometimes we have to get out of the way of other people's. And if we stop preventing ourselves and preventing others from coming to the waters, we can do what the text says and be part of great spiritual rejoicing. We are all part of this ongoing love story between God and creation. Remember it. Amen.